So hello everyone, welcome to the second session for the day about self-management. My name is Arieta Spinu and I am co-chairing the session with Barbara Korsley. Hi Barbara. Hello everybody. Um, my name is Barbara Crossley. I'm from the UK and I'm a member of the European Lung Foundation's Patient Advisory Group. I've been a member since 2015. Um, our first video is about my self-management regime and uh, antibiotic resistance. I originally made this video for the uh, European Respiratory Society's annual congress in 2020. It was for a session on, on antibiotic resistance, but it still holds true today. If we could have the video, please. My name's Barbara Crossley and I live in the Peak District in the centre of England. I'm a member of the Bronchiectasis Patient Advisory Group of the European Lung Foundation and we're all deeply concerned about the future of antibiotics. I've had bronchiectasis all my life, suffering severe chest infections as a child in the 1950s and 60s which led to lung surgery, a lobectomy of my left lung when I was 13. I'm now 68 and in 2009 I became colonised with Pseudomonas. This has resisted so far all the usual oral antibiotics, then nebulised colomycin which was a real pain to administer. I persisted with it for four months, but it was really inconvenient, time consuming, tying, and at the end of four months, it made my lungs bleed. It had no benefit whatsoever. In fact, quite the reverse. Then last year in August, I tried two weeks of intravenous keftazidine. Now, I'd never had intravenous antibiotic before, and at first I resented having to have a line inserted in my arm and wrapping it in cling film every morning before I had a shower, and then driving to hospital several miles twice a day for the infusions. But the effect was miraculous. I've never felt that way in my life before. I realized what it's like to feel normal. It was absolute bliss. And then in early September, I flew to last year's ERS Congress, flew back, starting to feel bad. And that was the end of my one month of bliss. Thanks, Keftazidim. It was nice while it lasted. For the past two or three years, I've taken a, a low dose prophylactic azithromycin, 250 milligrams every day. I cannot detect whether it does me any good or not, to be frank. Like most people with bronchiectasis, to the outside world, I try to pretend it isn't there. I have a good social life, I exercise daily, I never let it interfere with my work or with enjoying myself and I've never been hospitalised since 1965, touch wood. But that is unusual for someone with severe bronchiectasis. Most people suffer severe disruption to their lives with this condition. I put my condition down almost solely to rigorous self-managed physiotherapy because when the future of antibiotics is so uncertain 
You have to take control of your own condition. You have to do what you can to live your life as best you can. First of all, I nebulize with saline every day, usually in the late morning, and it takes about 15 minutes. <laughs> And then twice a day, I do this. This is called postural drainage because my chest is on a slope and it's enabling the mucus to drain so that I can get rid of it. And I combine it with the active cycle of breathing. So that means very, very deep breathing. <gasps> <sighs> <laughs> followed by huffing and then coughing and you do this on one side and then on my front and then on the other side and then on my back and by this means I get rid of about 150 grams of, that's about that size, of multicoloured mucus every single day of my life, winter or summer, healthy or sick. Well, when I'm sick, it's more. I do this twice a day. It takes about 20 minutes each. So in total, I'm devoting about an hour of my time every day to dealing with bronchiectasis. And it is my normal. Also normal is taking over-the-counter painkillers because most days Pseudomonas gives you a gentle all-over ache. It's a bit like a, a school bully that way, reminding you it's there. And in this background, it's hard to recognise an exacerbation because what doctors describe as an exacerbation is my normal. And I don't want to be running to the doctors all the time. I work hard at physiotherapy because without it, my chest fills up and I start to feel ill very quickly. To me, antibiotics are a last resort. But many of the bronchiectasis patients rely on them much more than me. What all this means for us is that we're living on a cliff edge, knowing the time is fast approaching when the bugs will finally beat the drugs. We're the canaries in the coal mine. We're the ones who'll go first. It affects our families. It affects our work, our financial situation, and our quality of life. One friend with bronchiectasis, an intensive care nurse, had to give up nursing on the front line because she contracted MRSA that stubbornly resisted antibiotics. Another friend struggled with a flu bug for seven years. And a third found that constant illness seriously affected her mental well-being. We all worry about the future. But I'm glad that there are signs of hope on the horizon. In July, the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations launched an antimicrobial resist resistance action fund worth nearly a billion dollars to support the development of new antibiotics. And I'm glad to see that research is going on to find alternative drugs, such as anti-inflammatories, that would go a long way to easing conditions such as mine. But I'm angry that we've been so profligate with antibiotics in the past. And I'm angry that the economics of drug development and production has held up research for so long. This market failure has to be solved with government support if necessary. The need is urgent for all of us.
Thank you so much, Barbara, for your presentation. It's amazing to see um, what it means for you and the lived, to share your lived experience. So we greatly appreciate that and, and your support. And I feel very privileged to be chairing this session with you and uh, be amongst other patients who share their experience about nutrition and the psychological aspects of bronchiectasis and also colleagues, uh, Dr. Guemine and Dr. Uh, Witt and Professor Pagnini. Uh, and we're going to talk about all these aspects of self-management from the patient point of view and from the professional, healthcare professional point of view. And my name, as I said, is Arieta Spinu. I'm a lecturer in cardiorespiratory physiotherapy practice and research at King's College London in the UK. And I've worked clinically with bronchiectasis patients in uh, long-term uh, settings like hospitals and, and community. Um, my, my presentation comes next, and I'm very glad that you showed your airway clearance routine because I'm gonna touch on this, on this topic. I'm going to start sharing my um, presentation. Just a minute. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, airway clearance and why is this important? Because I know that not all people with bronchiectasis uh, feel that they should allocate the time and effort in this uh, treatment. And I know that some people do try, but it takes some effort for them. And it, it's important to understand the rationale. So it comes nicely after the first session about the physiology and pathophysiology of bronchiectasis and how our lungs work. And I'm going to say a few things about that. So I'm going to speak about uh, caffeine bronchiectasis and what is mucus and what is airway clearance and why cough is not enough and why do we need to practice airway clearance techniques. And I, at the end, I'm going to speak about a couple of considerations. And although I won't be able to answer all the questions because I know that people um, have lots of questions about different airway clearance techniques, I hope that I will clarify a few things about this uh, treatment. So first I have a poll for you and my question cough, uh, if do you have cough and that bothers you? So you can choose one of the options, yes, it bothers me or no, it doesn't. And Janet, you can let me know when this is complete. Yeah, so most of the people seem to be bothered by their cough, uh, 78%, and others seem not to be that bothered, which which is all right because we know that um, symptoms can be different between patients. But what I wanted to say is that from a, a study we've done in assessing cough and, and counting cough uh, objectively with a small audio device, we have seen that patients with bronchiectasis uh, have uh, more than healthy in matched individuals. So if you have cough, you seem, if you have bronchiectasis, you seem to be coughing uh, much more during 24 hours compared to people who are uh, in similar age with you. 
And why do we cough? Why, why is that one of the symptoms of cactuses? We saw about mucus a bit earlier, and what I would like to clarify and explain to people who have bronchiectasis is that mucus, which is the normal airway secretions, the secretions we have in our lungs, uh, is mainly uh, made by water. So a large percent of the, of the secretions uh, that uh, are within our airways, it, it's 95% is water, and then there's some salts and proteins. And what does this mean for airway clearance? It means that if you hydrate well, it can help your secretion to become more loose and less sticky. And because people with bronchiectasis lots of times have difficulties to clear their secretions because they feel very sticky, that means that if you hydrate with um, uh, having a bit of more water, drinking more water, or using nebulized cell line or hypertonic cell line nebulization, this can help you prepare for your airway clearance techniques. So even before you do your techniques or before you use your devices, there is something you can do to make this more effective. And you see this picture before, uh, it's important, like Barbara said, to understand what's your baseline, to understand what is normal for you and what color of the sputum is normal for you and what consistency is normal for you. That means you can recognize an exacerbation quite early when it happens. So if your uh, phlegm becomes darker or if it becomes more sticky, that's a sign that you need to allocate more time for your airway clearance or to do something more drastically. And this is how the mucus would uh, be in within your airways. And it's important to know the volume of the, uh, of the secretions you normally produce and you bring up when you are uh, well on the day and also the consistency. So understand what is the, the baseline for you. And when it comes to airway clearance, we have two normal mechanisms and we've seen the and auxiliary escalator early on uh, in the video, uh, and there is also cough. These are the two things that can help us clear our test. And for pool with bronchiectasis, we have more mucus than we would normally have. So that means that we need a cough and mucociliary clearance to work harder. And before we go to uh, what we can do to self-manage, I would like to point out what is actually each one of these mechanisms. So cough is a, a, a reflex and it's also a symptom where it has three main phases. We have the inspiratory phase where we take a really deep breath in, the compressive phase when the person uh, blocks uh, their um, airways by the glottis, we have a glottic closure, and we have the expiratory phase where we forcefully expire, exhale air, uh, a, a bigger vol volume of air and very, very fast. And this is when the clearance of the airways actually takes place. But I would like to show you uh, where this actually works. So if you consider the airways as a, as a, a tree, which has branches, and each branch goes to, to smaller and smaller branches until we get to the airway sacs where the exchange of the air happens. You can see that the larynx, so your windpipe, and the largest bronchi are the ones that are uh, responsible for our cough. And what does that mean for uh, airway clearance? It means that secretions that are located in smaller airways cannot be cleared by cough alone because cough cannot be initiated in these locations. So you need something else to help the secretions get higher and you are able then to expectorate them um, uh, via huffing or coughing. And you saw about the mucociliary escalator much better earlier. So this is the tiny hair that um, move the secretions towards your mouth. And I would like to ask you um, another question. 
before I explain what I, um, I know about airway clearance, do you use any of our clearance techniques or devices? And I would be very interested to know the answers. And again, it's an answer of yes or no. So, um, airway clearance techniques or devices, yes. If you don't use those and you just cough when you have secretions, it will be no. Can we have the answers? Okay, so 77% of you uh, reports that they use an airway clearance technique or device and about 23% do not. Thank you for that. I would be interested to know if those who don't use the airway clearance techniques do they have an issue with their um, uh, separations or not. But why use airway clearance techniques or devices? So if you have phlegm, why do you need to use that? And if some of these people who replied no need to use airway clearance techniques, um, then I think I will try to advocate in, in favor of that. So we know that there is a lot of um, guidelines that uh, report we should uh, use airway clearance techniques uh, when people have bronchiectasis. And there is uh, the European Respiratory Society guideline, the British Thoracic Society, Spanish, uh, New Zealand, uh, and lots of other guidelines as well. And we have reviewed them and we saw that they do advocate for using um, techniques or devices, but the quality of evidence is low. So we need more studies about uh, supporting the results of the airway clearance techniques, particularly when it comes to comparing one to the other one. But we know that any airway clearance technique is better than cough alone or better than doing nothing. So this is an important message to take uh, home because it shows that uh, allocating some time and effort for this treatment is important for managing your condition. And there is a great variety of airway clearance techniques. We have the active, active cycle of breathing techniques, which is one of the simplest methods. We have the postural drainers uh, that uh, Barbara showed you earlier in combination with the active cycle of breathing techniques in the video. And there's also manual techniques that uh, physiotherapists or carers can use and other, and other techniques that are slightly more advanced. And we have also a great variety of devices. And the reason why I show you these um, two pictures is to actually tell you that you have a, a great um, source of things to choose from. So if you find that something is not really for you, you can try something different that could be more effective. So you could discuss with your physiotherapist or whoever is looking after your airway clearance about escalating your management plan or about changing what you currently have if this is not effective. And we know from studies that people in different areas of the world use different techniques or devices and there is a preference in, in some of them depending on where you live. So this could be uh, due to different um, reasons. So it could be what is available from your healthcare system or um, what physiotherapists know better and what do they prefer in using, what's the, the cost of the device or the technique and other things. But it just demonstrates how variable our current management is uh, throughout the world. And at the moment with uh, some colleagues from the European Respiratory Society, we are uh, working in a task force to see what's needed in the research and in the 
um, learning of airway clearance for adults with bronchiectasis and along with uh, Beatriz Herrero Cortina for, from Spain and lots of other experts and, and patients from the ELF, we are trying to, to make a, a map on what we need to do to move forward and, and have better results on airway clearance. But what we currently know is that you can start with some, something simple, so you can start with a technique uh, that you can be taught. And if this, not, this is not effective and doesn't help you clear completely your, your test, then you can think about adding a device or using a device alone or using a combination of techniques. So you can have a, a couple of different steps of how you can work on your airway clearance and always try to start with the simplest one and if it's not enough or effective you can move on. And a common question we have from patients is where do you know, uh, when do you stop and how do you know you need to stop? And I think that um, it comes back to knowing what's your normal and what's your baseline. So how much do you clear in a good day? How much phlegm do you bring up? If you think that after your airway clearance, you have cleared your chest, you don't need to continue to a specific amount of time. If you feel that you are too tired to continue or it has taken too much of your time, then again, you can stop at that point. Uh, but knowing how much you're cle you clear generally is a, is a key tip, I would say, um, to patients. So know that you can continue until you feel clear completely or until you think that you cannot continue or you become breathless tired or it's already too long it's taken for example half an hour or, or even longer and, and you don't find that is effective then you need you need to consider is the technique appropriate for you or do you need to change it if you find consistently that it takes too long and you cannot clear completely although some patients would still report that even after you have um, uh, uh, used the technique, which is uh, uh, ideal. And how do you manage um, in terms of general advice would be, of course, speak to a specialist and speak to someone who knows about airway clearance. And I would say be careful about uh, the resources that you use. So try to use uh, resources that are uh, affiliated with uh, a, a reliable uh, organization like the European Lung Foundation or the Embark uh, Resources or um, um, university and um, other uh, websites. You need to be aware of the contraindications and the precautions of the technique you use. And it's quite important to understand how well you know the technique. So if you use something that you don't know very well, uh, it's not going to work. And equally, you need to practice it to uh, make it work well. So I think uh, you need to be patient and try before you, you decide to move on to something different. You also don't need to use the same thing when you're clinically stable, when you're well or during an exacerbation. You might need to change your technique when you have an exacerbation and feel more unwell you can ask uh, whoever is working with you about airway clearance to see what's the best option for when you have an exacerbation. And everything is related to your own preference and what you're doing during your day, your age, your, um, uh, your work, and lots of different factors that will help you adhere with the treatment. So it's good if you make some um, some investigation when you begin about um, identifying what's most uh, uh, important for you and what you can use because if you don't use something it, it, it's not going to work and try to be independent if you can uh, and consider about cost and access is an, another thing you need to put into the equation and this, in the same way, when you're progressing or if the disease has become worse or if there's any changes in your life, then you need to reassess if that's the most appropriate technique for you. So it doesn't mean that if you have one technique, you're going to continue with that throughout your life. You can always reassess and see if that's appropriate or not. 
and think about outcome measures you can use about um, its effectiveness or not. So do you bring up enough phlegm? Uh, do you feel like you, you've cleared your chest after you've done it? Do you feel like you gain a bit more energy after doing uh, your airway clearance during the day and these kind of things? And I know that it doesn't answer all of the questions you might have for airway clearance. And it's mainly because this is a, a very big topic to be covered within 10 minutes. And, and we know that um, people get uh, uh, different responses to different techniques, lots of things that you need to consider before you decide. So it's very much a tailored treatment you need to consider. But I think there's a, a few things you can start with. Uh, before we go to a specialist and, and, and find about it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Arietta, for a really comprehensive talk. I find the way I, uh, the way I know that I've finished is I listen to my chest. If it's still rattling or crackling or, or rumbling, I carry on. But if it, it sounds clear, then it is clear. Um, yeah. So listening is is important, I think. Yes, exactly. And as you said, sometimes you might need to do a couple of halves. Like halving is when you are forcing a, a bit of air out. It, it's a bit more like coughing, but not exactly because you don't close your glottis. So you can do like a <sighs> steaming your a mirror, for example. And and if you hear these crackles, then you can continue. It means that um, you haven't completely cleared your chest. Uh, but as I said, this is not the case for everyone. And it might be for some patients that they keep doing airway clearance, but they still never completely clear their chest. So it's important to identify what, what's uh, the case for you. That's right. So we better go on to our next talk now which is uh, another talk from a patient. Um, this is from Joyce Norwell, who is a member of the ELF patient advisory group. And she's going to talk about diet and nutrition, the things that have helped her. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Joyce and I have bronchiectasis with pseudomonas, but I also have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And it is this that I want to talk about to you for a few minutes, just to tell you how I managed to cope and hopefully be able to give you some ideas of how you might be able to cope if you're suffering from this as well. I get flare-ups of the bronchiectasis and during that time, because of the antibiotics, I find that I find it very difficult to eat because I lose my appetite and also with the cramps and the pain, I don't really want to eat. So my doctor very kindly prescribes me some nutritional drinks, which I can then take. And this means that I'm getting nourishment. But again, that isn't enough to keep me going. So I have to supplement that with some small meals, but at least it takes away that worry about, I don't want to eat and getting too weak to cope. You can get these from the doctor, or you can get them at the chemist, or you can buy them online. I find that small meals generally are better for me. Little and often, doesn't matter what it is, but just so long as there is something being eaten sort of every two or three hours, and also including drinks, because of course the drinks are most important, especially during a flare-up where they can help to make the mucus easier to cough up. After a while, I started to research to see if there was any help anywhere that I could have with the IBS. So I got onto the internet and came across Monash University in Australia, and they happened to be doing some research into this. So. Um, reading their work, I thought, well, this sounds really good. So I've been trying that um, program. And over the years, they've developed a very useful website, which I, unfortunately, I can't discuss with you today because I haven't got time. But I would suggest that if you are interested and have IBS, you might like to look at it. And you will find there all the information you want, including some very useful recipes. I used to find that my social life 
was very impaired because I could go out to restaurants to eat because I would always be ill and feel embarrassed about asking what was on the menu and it really wasn't worth all the fuss and bother. But now, luckily, restaurants are beginning to realise that people do have different food allergies and difficulties and preferences. So it is quite all right when you go out, and this is what I do now, is to ask what's on the menu, what actually is in this meal. Can you leave out certain foods? Because I've found that brassicas, onions, um, uh, red meat are things that do upset me, plus other things. But then have a chat with the waiter and you'll often find that they will be very kind. And if they can't give you the actual meal that's on the menu, they will make something that you will enjoy. So that means that you can relax, your friends can relax, and you can have a good social interaction and not be worried about going home and being up half the night because you've eaten something that's upset you. And it is so important to get this social interaction. The same with your friends. Um, Again, I wouldn't go to the houses for the same reason. But now I ask them, and again, if it's going to be a a lot of trouble, because it's difficult when your friends are making a meal for other people to make one special one, I'll sit and have a boiled egg. I can have a nice chat with everybody. They're enjoying their meal. My host doesn't feel embarrassed because she can't feed me. And so that that makes things well. So make sure that you do get some good social life and don't be afraid to ask or uh, to help yourself. So in this very short time, I hope I've showed you some ways that you can help yourself with IBS and that I've encouraged you to look look out and see what you can find for yourself. And don't be afraid to ask. There is help out there. And your local dietitian and your doctor, and even as I've explained, going on the web, you can find help out there. Also, if some of you already found out ways of helping yourself with the IBS and would like to share it with us, um, please contact us at ELF or put it into the chat box. And if you want to ask any questions and find out anything, <coughs> excuse me, if you want to ask me anything, um, don't be afraid to get in touch with me via ELF and we can see if we can help. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry Joyce won't be able to uh, be with us to answer questions live today, but she will give written answers, um, which will be put on the website later with the recording. So thank you. Arietta, would you like to introduce the next speaker? Yes, thank you, Barbara. So it's a very great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Peter Gemine, who is a respiratory physician in St. Nicholas, Belgium. His PhD was in non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis, and along with him today, he has Elaine David, who is a dietitian at the Vitas Hospital in Belgium, and has a specialist interest in nutrition and diet in the respiratory diseases. Thank you both. Thank you, Arietta. Can you hear me, Arietta? Yes? Okay, perfect. Uh, Yes, Yes. yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I will start the presentation. Just a second. Can you see the slides? Not yet. Not yet? Just a second. Now? Do I need to share screen maybe? Yeah. Yes. Just a second. Share screen, PowerPoint. This is better, probably. Can you see the slides now? Yes, we if can you can launch them for screen now. OK. Perfect. Is this OK? Um, not yet. Maybe one more click. Um, just a second. No, and that doesn't work. Alternatively, and uh, go to the right bottom corner. Just wait. Um, right bottom corner. There's nothing here. There is a small, uh, small icon next to percentage of the view. Can you see? I cannot see anything. No. If you want, I can share the slides for you. Yeah, but they have been changed a little bit. So, but I.
Can you see the slides here now? Yeah, but not. You cannot see the slides? We can see them, but uh, not, the, not, the, not the presentation. OK, uh, that's strange. Maybe it's best then you do the slides. OK. Okay, thank you. So uh, we've been given the difficult task to talk to you about the practical, practical aspects of nutrition and bronchiectasis because there's not a lot of research and data on the topic. Uh, I'm a respiratory physician in Belgium. This is my wife. She's a registered dietitian in Belgium uh, and specialized in respiratory uh, diet, I would say. Uh, and we're trying to, today we're going to tackle a few questions. Um, I cannot go to the next slide. There's no, I don't have control over the slides. I gave you control, Peter. Okay. Okay. So these are the questions that we will be tackling today. I will take the first few questions and then Alan will uh, end with some practical recommendations for all of you and how to uh, improve your diet uh, if you are dealing with bronchiectasis. I still cannot control my slides. Could you give me control over the slides, please? Excuse me? Now? No, it's not working. I cannot control okay. the slides. Try to click on the screen. Yes, right click on the screen. Yes. I cannot right click on the screen. So then maybe tell me next slide which time you want to switch. OK. Just say next slide. So the first question is, does milk make mucus? And the reason why we uh, took these questions because all these questions came up last year in the frequently asked questions. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Next slide. Because, uh, so um, the question, does milk make mucus? Well, around 20 to 30 percent of the people, if you ask on the streets, believe that milk makes mucus. Um, and those who believe milk makes mucus report more symptoms when they are drinking milk. So we've tried to look at this in asthma. In the right bottom corner, you can see uh, asthmatic lung and normal lung. And in asthma, the airway diameter is smaller. And um, if milk would produce mucus, you would have a decrease in the diameter and therefore it would impact lung function. But if you look at the data, after drinking milk, they have looked at lung function in patients who got who have asthma and drank milk and patients who drank placebo. And there was no difference, statistical difference between the two patient groups. So that suggests of, as a first uh, evidence that there is no increase of mucus in uh, drinking milk. The second study, and that's the table in the middle, was looking at the number of glasses people take uh, of milk and look whether there's a difference in mucus weight when they expectorate. And as you can see, there's no difference in mucus weight uh, during expectoration or not an increase of cough when there's more intake of milk. And the left table so shows you a study where they compared placebo group and milk group and looked whether or not all these symptoms were different between the two groups. And as you can see, there's no statistical significant difference whether patients drank milk or placebo group in an increase of sputa uh, present or between the complaints that the patients had uh, after drinking milk or placebo. So that really shows us that milk does not make mucus. Next slide. But why am I feeling then that there is increase in sputum? Well, 
you have to remember that milk is an emulsion it's droplets of fat hanging in water and the saliva when you drink milk makes these fatty drops clump together and it gives a sort of mucus like properties it gives like the the form of mucus in the back of your throat and that is what you're feeling but there is no increase of mucus inside of the lungs because one of the questions in the Q&A was should I stop drinking milk should I stop uh, eating sugar because it will affect my mucus don't stop drinking milk next slide because then what happens is you are going to avoid dairy products and that can lead to nutritional consequences for example in children or parents believe that their child had food intolerance there's a high difference that was seen because milk was the second most commonly avoided food in those patients and we know from literature that if your intake of milk fluid dairy and yogurt and cheese is higher then you have stronger bones as compared to patients who use less milk or avoid dairy products. Next slide. So why is drinking milk then important for bronchiectasis? And then we come to the next question that was asked last year. Is my osteoporosis linked to my bronchiectasis and what to do? Next slide. Well, if we look at bronchiectasis, next slide, please. If we look at bronchiectasis, we see that patients with more severe disease so uh, worse desaturation during a walking test, lower lung function, higher disease severity, more hospitalizations. Those patients, as you can see in the right columns here, have more osteopenia and osteoporosis. So more brittle bones as compar compared to healthy controls. Next slide. And we know from literature that drinking milk will provide you with vitamin D and calcium to build your bone. The next question we had from last year is why does reflux really matter for my bronchiectasis? Next slide. Well, reflux, what is it? It's actually uh, uh, the stomach, the fluid in the stomach or the food in the stomach going back up the esophagus. Normally you have a circular muscle, the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter that will prevent uh, um, stomach uh, fluid going back to the esophagus but from time to time a muscle needs to relax and in some patients you see an increase as compared to healthy controls of reflux and it's more present in patients with bronchiectasis and the, the, the danger is that these small reflux particles cannot only uh, give a sore throat and give some hoarseness but can also be uh, traveling in the airways and increase the inflammation this is was what was suggested in literature and next slide research by melissa mcdowell actually um, confirmed this uh, next slide she showed that in patients with reflux and bronchiectasis next slide they have more exacerbations they have more severe disease and they have a worse quality of life but there's one thing that can alleviate this, and that's the use of macrolides, so azithromycin, for example, because we know that macrolides not only are antibiotic and anti-inflammatory probably, but they also increase the gastric emptying. And we think that that's one of the reasons why patients with macrolide use do not have the negative effects on exacerbations and hospitalizations when they have reflux and bronchiectasis. Next slide. Then the next question last year was why do we need to drink enough water next slide now um, the previous talks have already tackled a little bit this question but if you look at the airways and you put them under a microscope you see the blood vessels you see the epithelial cells and then the small little cilia or hairs that are used or their function one of their functions is to um, transport mucus to the upper airways where you can easily cough it up and in bronchiectasis these cilia and in healthy patients as well are functioning in what we call the periciliar layer and they tend to clock together uh, in patients with bronchiectasis and so water as you can see down here you can see that water is uh, has the possibility to travel in between the epithelial cells to the periciliar layer so providing enough water not being dehydrated is very important because then you provide the body of enough water that can travel through between the cells through the periciliar layer so the cilia can function better so drinking enough water ne next slide is very important next slide Peter, just a, a quick comment from the admin team. Um, the, the, the translator is struggling to keep up with you, so if you could speak just slightly slower. That would okay, be no problem. 
Thank you. Um, the next question uh, is, what does my gut have to do with my lungs? And I'm going to be very short on this topic because we're running out of time because of the te te technical issues. Next slide. But uh, basically, there is a, a very important communication between the gut and the lungs. So in the lungs, the lungs are not sterile. You have a high microbial diversity in healthy lung and a low microbial density. And in diseased lung, this is the inverse. You have low microbial diversity and high microbial density. And we know that this is influenced by the gut. So in the gut, there are a lot of bacteria, high density, high diversity. And this will influence by using bacterial seeding, the lymphocytes, those are all technical terms, but basically the bacteria and the gut also alter your immune system and they can communicate with the rest of the body, so also with the lungs, through blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels. And all sorts of external factors and internal factors are going to change that balance between the two, which we call the gut-lung axis. For example, drugs, antibiotic use, genetic factors, but also dietary fibers, high-fat diets. And in certain other respiratory diseases, pre- and probiotics have been suggested to be a possible, to have a possible positive effect on the axis between gut and lung. This is on the right side, just a small study in mice where they instilled pseudomonas in the airways of mice and looked at the gut and what they saw was that gut cells, healthy gut cells, were dying off during the next 24 hours after installation of pseudomonas. So there you see that there is a communication between the gut and the lung present uh, and is certainly at this point not enough, not enough research but there's quite a lot of research going on between the communication between the gut and the lung. So keeping a healthy gut is also important for your lung health. Next slide. So the next few questions are going to be tackled by Ellen um, and she will give you some practical recommendations. I will start to give you some um, answer to the question that shortness of breath impacts my meal and how you can tackle this uh, by some practical um, recommendations. Um, first I want to say that um, for people with bronchiectasis, for people with um, lung problems, some, ac some um, eating is an activity, it's an exercise for you. So make sure to rest some uh, 15 to 30 minutes before your meal. Um, that can help to be um, come more um, calm and to have a normal breathing again. It's smaller and more frequent meals. Sometimes eating two or three times every two or three uh, hour it can help you. Clear your airways before meal time can also be very helpful. Um, first sleep breathing can help you through your meal. Eat upright and sit up at least 30 minutes after your meal. That is good for your uh, digestion, but also if you have um, reflux. If you are oxygen depend dependent, um, use your oxygen during your meal time. Um, often we see patients that are taking off the oxygen just for eating, but as I said, um, eating is an activity, so use your oxygen dur during your, your meal. Prevent overweight. Choose some easy to chew foods because of the strenuous activity. Um, make some mashed potatoes, some minced meats, um, pastas, add some extra sauce to your food. That can all be helpful um, to eat more um, easy. Don't be too hard on yourself and, and don't want to prepare some three, four course meals. Take some easy to prepare food. Um, food prepping can also be very good. So one day you cook for two days, for example, or on the days you're feeling better, you have um, less shortness of breath, you can um, make some, for example, some spaghetti sauce and you make it for two or three days and you take, put it in the, in the fridge and then you can take it out and just heat it on the days you don't feel well. The next slide, please. 
Another question was, why does food matter? Next slide. In the bronchiectasy severity index, that's a tool to calculate mortality and morbidity in bronchiectasis, a body mass index lower than 18.5 was allocated to score 2. Underweight has the same impact on mortality rate, on hospitalizations, on the exacerbation frequency as having three or more exacerbations a year as a same impact as a low FEV1 um, as having a being very breathless and underweight is even more important for the mortality and morbidity than being colonized by bugs or have more than three lobs affected. Next slide. Next slide. Yes, your weight does matter and so does food. Next slide. I will skip this one. Next slide. Yeah. So, um, to meet your energy needs, you have to take some high energy and high protein diets. Eat frequently. I already said every two, three hours eating um, is very helpful um, if you're short of bread, but also um, to get enough energy and to get enough uh, proteins, enough macro micronutrients a day. Start your meal with some high energy food. Um, in a lot of cultures, it is used to start your meal with soup or um, a salad, for example. And that's our healthy products, but um, because of the fluid, because of the higher fibers, uh, it's they give not much energy, not much proteins, but they give you a full stomach. So you won't eat from the main course, from the food that with the highest energy. Um, so just start with the food, with with the the the, the, the plate with some um, meat, some fish, uh, some uh, mashed potatoes, for example. That will be better. Choose some full fat milk and milk products. For the moment there are also a lot of uh, milk products with high protein, like the Greek yogurt or um, products like skir for example. That's also very good. Um, add some avocado, nuts, olive oil, rapeseed, rapeseed oil to your meals. They are high in fat, high in calories and have a good um, fatty acids, some milkshake or some smoothie, smoothie can be used du uh, during the day um, and to uh, attach to your normal meal you can use some oral nutritional supplements, um, make sure you take some medical uh, things um, and not something from the supermarket because just to be sure you have the um, best quality of um, uh, proteins. Also use it as a supplement during the day or at late night snack and not as meal replacement because you don't want to eat m less of your normal meals because of the supplement. It has to be an extra above um, your normal food. So m sometimes you, it's so you can take some thing to drink, a, a nutritional supplement to drink and you start it in the morning, just sip it and sip it every hour once uh, and then it's empty when you go to sleep and you have some extra uh, 300 calories a day um, wi without it uh, influences your normal meals. Next slide. So follow up your weight. Malnutrition is not only in people who are underweight, also people with a normal body mass index can become uh, malnourished. So be aware of weight loss, because 5% of unintentionally body loss of body weight in one month or 10% loss of body weight in six months can uh, give you a high risk of malnutrition. So weigh yourself once a week and note it down so you can throw back at it um, every now and then and, and go see if you um, what was your weight a few weeks, a few months ago and you can um, be aware of weight loss. Next slide. Go for some personal advice. Let the dietitian calculate your basic metabolic rate, your daily needs of macro micronutrients, as bronchiectasis causes a higher metabolic rate than in healthy people due to the inflammation, to the higher breathing frequency and to chronic infection. Next slide. So are there any anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory foods? Next slide. 
on this slide you can see that um, it's not surprisingly that the same foods on an inflammation diet are generally considered as being unhealthy and contributing weight gain um, like sodas, fried food, refined carbs, some processed meats. It is because the inflammation is an important underlying mechanism for the development of this chronic disease. Yet in several studies, even after researchers took obesity into account, the link between foods and inflammation remained, which suggests weight gain isn't the sole driver. Some of the food components or ingredients may have independent effects on the inflammation over and above the increased caloric intake, but there is no evidence found that anti-inflammation diet can help uh, to counter the inflammation in bronchiectasis. Next slide. Regarding the roles of other nutrients and the lung microbiota and its modulation, there is presently not enough evidence to make any clear conclusion. Re research on possible nutrients other than vitamin D is warranted. High quality trials focusing on vitamin D, zinc, other nutrients and flavonoids um, and the immune and bronchiectasis markers would be worthy of a future study. Next slide. So be aware of hypes, trends, rumors and gossip. The mechanism between diet and lung inflammation is hypothesized to relate to antioxidant properties of certain nutrients. Foods that contribute to lower diet quality scores have all been associated with overweight and obesity. The diet quality was associated with some spirometric restriction controlling for body mass index classification, suggesting that low quality foods not only displace the intake of the higher quality antioxidant containing foods, but may also be contributing to inflammatory processes independent of the weight status. So it is a challenge um, finding the balance between, between this high quality diet and a high energy diet. But once again, a professional can help you with that. So find someone with the experience and the knowledge about this topic. Next slide. I will skip this one too, please. Next. Yeah. Um, and to end, I will get some um, take home messages to conclude. Next. So milk does not cause mucus. Reflux and osteoporosis are important nutrition linked comorbidities. Hydration is very important for mucus clearance. Drink at least two liters a day. Pre and probiotics might be beneficial. Underweight is an important risk factor for mortality and morbidity. Eat smaller but frequent upright meals after you rest a bit. And if you're underweight, take a high energy and high protein diet and consult a dietitian to get an indication of your basic metabolic rate and get individual counseling. So I hope we got you interested in food by this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much uh, Peter, Peter and, and Ellen. Ellen. That's a really That's useful a talk. I think the diet, diet is, is, is a, a subject that's uh, uh, not been explored enough in relation to bronchiectasis. And, and uh, patients, patients certainly have a demand for um, increased information. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, our next talk is a combined one from members of the um, ELF bronchiectasis patient advisory group. It's about the psychological and social aspects of living with bronchiectasis. And the speakers are Annette Posthumus from the Netherlands, Sandra Gori from Italy, Maria Suarez from Portugal, and myself and Joyce from the UK. Thank you. I was diagnosed as a young child, so I've never known anything else, and I'll be 70 next month. I have this condition since my childhood, so I don't really know life without it. My 
behavior has changed a lot after my bronchiectasis diagnosis in 2015. Since then, I used to panic each time a colleague at work would sneeze or when my friends invited me over the house and discovering their child was sick with high fever. Until I finally found all possible excuses to avoid social gatherings, especially in winter time. I used to be very active. I have three kids. I'm a scientist. I work full time. And sometimes finding myself in a situation where I'm not reliable. That means that I frequently have to take sick leave. Sometimes I can't uh, look after my children as I would normally do. It's not only you who have the disease, but also your family. Um, I have three beautiful daughters and a very um, loving husband. Um, and they also, uh, also always have to consider um, my state of being and dealing with it as well. And you often feel guilty about it. I look well. Nobody would know that I was ill. So. People would cheer me up and said, well, you do look well, you know, I'm so pleased you're feeling better. And I said, well, actually, I'm off to hospital tomorrow. Part of the problem is, is that people don't understand it. Um, they've never heard of it. And when they see you, you look perfectly normal. Um, they don't see us behind closed doors coughing our hearts out, deep breathing. Because it's not like any other illness, is it? We can't just say, oh, I've got flu, I'll go to bed for a fortnight and I'll be okay. That's it, end of. This comes back every three months. And socially, I can't meet my friends, although I do try to get out a little bit. So it is isol very isolating. Travelling also had always been my great passion and uh, I stopped taking airplanes because I really was uh, afraid uh, about all the people uh, coughing around me and sitting next to me. And these things uh, have, have taken a toll on my ability to, to deal with the disease. So I looked for help. My life is very limited and I have been represented it over the time. Yes, it does affect me. I get very angry that people only see me as the illness and I'm not the illness. We are all very used to looking after our lungs <clears throat> and taking preventive measures and taking care of ourselves when we get sick. But an important aspect of managing the disease, I believe, is also to look after your mental health. Over the last I would say 70 years. I have been denying this because nobody will talk about it. It's something that nobody talks about. It's something Joyce has got, but we don't know what. She's just a nuisance. We can't do this, can't do that because of her. And it's always been a negative. There's never been any positive. For me, the COVID period was a kind of a trigger, actually. Um, I was very anxious and uh, was not longer able to deal with my uh, um, condition mentally. Um, so I seeked help and I realized I should have done that much longer uh, before. This is the first time that I talked about having bronchiectasis. First time I've met people who've got, actually got bronchiectasis. And this has enabled me to have the courage to be, to be able to say, right, I'm not going to be owned by this. I'm still me and I'm not going to hide away from it anymore. I have found relaxation and meditation very useful. I've been meditating for many, many years ago. Now, when my friends invite me out for dinner or over their house, I speak frankly, saying that I can join them only if they are all in good health conditions, explaining my disease and by doing so, also spreading our awareness about our pathology. I've been working together with a, a psychologist to be able to cope with this better to find ways to be more at peace with what's happening and in that way also deal, deal better with the disease it's, itself. I think it's very important for physicians to realize uh, how this long life condition not only is a physical um, disease but also uh, it can be, can be mentally very hard and they should discuss this with their patients and um, offer them help um, if uh, required or needed. We work as a team, which is most important with bronchiectasis. My consultant has his knowledge, but he hasn't got bronchiectasis. 
I've got the bronchiectasis, I want his knowledge, and so we work together. If you could help us to manage daily life better, not just the crises, it would be much appreciated. And uh, the message I would like to leave here is looked after your mind and your emotional um, well-being as well as your lungs. Thank you all for sharing this video and experience with bronchiectasis. I think um, what you said has echoed lots of things that we have heard as clinicians uh, from people who have this condition. So it's very important that we all raise awareness to the public about bronchiectasis, which is not a very well-known disease. And I think we can change it if we work together. So it was amazing to hear from lots of people with this condition from different parts of the world. Our next speaker, Professor, Fra Professor Francesco Pagnini, is going to talk uh, more about health, uh, mental health and living with uh, bronchiectasis. He is a professor in the clinical psychology at the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Milan, Italy and his primary research interest is focused on the relationship between mind and body. And in particular, he tries to use uh, psychological knowledge and techniques to change the impact of some uh, chronic diseases with a specific focus on respiratory uh, conditions. So thank you very much, uh, Professor. Well, thank you. And thank all the organizer for inviting me. Can I share my screen or do you prefer to share it? Go ahead, please. All right. So I'm not sure that I, yeah. No. Hold on just a second. There was an issue with my Zoom. Uh, can you, do you have it? Do you have the slides and can yes. you share them? Sure. Thank you. Just got a new laptop. Sorry for that. And thanks for sharing this video. For real, that's uh, a lot of things we're gonna talk about, we're gonna tap in, we're already there. So, all right, we can move to the first one. So in general, we know that uh, people with respiratory diseases also have higher psychological comorbidities than the general population and in fact, we know that respiratory problems are also connected with uh, some risk for mental health. But we know, we also know that mental health can contribute. So for example, levels of anxiety and depression can either directly or indirectly contribute on the, uh, on the development of the symptoms. For example, I think it's, it's pretty common experience for many people to experience anxiety together, a worsening of the symptoms. And one can say that it's just one way, probably not. Anxiety can also trigger respiratory, um, respiratory uh, symptoms. Uh, next slide, please. And specifically with bronchiectasis. So I must say that this is, uh, a very well un underexplored uh, area in the literature. There are very limited studies, so we don't we don't fully have uh, a good idea about well how mental health uh, is more in general for people with bronchiectasis. But we know for sure that living with it. Uh, is a sort of a risk factor for developing some unwanted psychological comorbidities. And specifically, the literature has identified two areas in which that seems to be particularly problematic. One is the area of depressive symptoms. So um, there are a lot of small studies with small samples, but the most reliable is a recent multicenter study that found that about 
20% of people with bronchiectasis also experience some form of clinically significant depression. And other studies go up to 33 or 40 percent. Um, the point is, this is a huge percentage. It's about four times the general population, the, the prevalence in the general population. So this is a, it's a big, a big aspect. But at the same time, only a small percentage of these people experiencing depression have also received a diagnosis of depression. And therefore, only a small part of that is also receiving a proper treatment. So just keep it here. Next slide, please. please. And the risk factors to develop these forms of depression are, well, um, frequent, frequent exacerbations or then shortness of breath, and more in general, the feeling of having poor control of one's disease and being admitted to an emergency department more than certain times over, uh, over, over time, uh, that's also a risk factor. Fatigue, experiencing a high level of fatigue is also correlated to develop some form of depressive reaction. But one of the main thing is sleep disturbance. We know that sleep is very much associated with, level, with, with our mental health. Um, but sleep disturbance seems to be particularly important here in this case. And also, one thing that keep on returning in some of these studies is living with a partner. And in most literature, living with a partner is a protective factor. Here, that's a risk factor. And it goes unexplained. My suggestion from a clinical perspective could be to tap into something that somebody said in the, in the video that perhaps there could be a sense of guilt. You know, the, the idea of being a burden and being a guilt to reduce the activity of people I live with. And that's a risk factor for depression. Now, active screening for depression is now needed. So we need to keep that monitored because also we need to optimize the treatment because depressive features are not just something that we experience and that's it. Uh, depressive symptoms also influence the illness per se and they may influence treatment adherence, motivation, lifestyle more in general. So this is something to be mindful of. Next slide, please. But depression, just from a mere statistical perspective, isn't the main risk anxiety is. Because anxiety seems to be very much present under a court of people with bronchiectasis. And in fact, it's been reported in about half people. And when I talk about anxiety, I talk about clinical levels of our like, sort of threshold that we consider worrisome. And factors associated with anxiety include, well, younger people tend to be more, uh, more prone to develop anxiety, uh, certain forms of education below college, and again, sleep disturbance. And next slide, please. Can, can we go to the next one? Thank you. So that said, these are just a couple of examples, but I think that everybody thinking about the people they know with bronchiectasis, um, there are other aspects that could consider worth, worth relevance, but just because I didn't want to take all the time to, to investigate that because I wanted to go to the, well, well, what can we do? There are several aspects, there are several tips and several things that we can do to support mental health. And the first and the most important thing is to acknowledge that it matters. You know, you break, you break your knees, you go to an orthopedic, period. You don't think, well, I can handle it myself. That doesn't happen with, what well, doesn't often happen with mental, mental issues. And with mental issues, I'm not referring to severe psychiatric condition. I'm referring to a lot of, well, we can, see, we can consider them as setbacks, as challenging moments, as, uh, periods in which we need to readdress part of our life, these things 
can be challenging, especially when they interact with some physical conditions, as it can happen with people with bronchiectasis. And so just you know, feeling down, anxious, or guilty, these are now weaknesses. And just, just having the idea of being strong and then holding it myself, it's just not worth it. We have a lot of options. We have a lot of things that we can do. Next slide, please. So once we take out the idea that taking care of our mental health is not something, I mean, this is something that, that's not just accessible. It's also something that we have to deal with. We have to be mindful that our mental health also depends on how we look at it. So we need to respect that. Then once we acknowledge that, I also need to self-monitor myself. How am I doing? How do I feel? You know, these sort of questions, sometimes, we put them on a the side and we just focus on the physical side. And we think, how is my breath going today? How is my bronchiectasis going today? And consider that as a sort of an indicator um, of the level of my well being. Well, that's probably not just, just not enough. There are many other things that compose my life, including my, you know, my psychological life, my social life, my expectations, and so on. So am I worried or concerned about something? And what that is, what is that? And when, I, when I'm stressed, when I feel anxious, what do I think about? What am I doing? Who am I with? And writing down these things, that's a very important aspect, actually. If I write down, if I keep a diary, perhaps, or even, even if I keep it unstructured, I just write down my worries. It's a way of detach them from myself and they're there. Then maybe I can manage them better. Can we go to the next one, please? Now we mentioned that uh, sleep is a very important factor to promote well-being, mental well-being, and also physical, but now we focus on the, on the mental component. And there is a thing in medical, in, med, in sleep medicine, that it's sleep hygiene. There are many things we can do to sleep better. And I don't wanna take all the time uh, to explore that, but because that's, that's a specific topic. But for example, knowing that if I read my smartphone right before I sleep, that will impact my sleep quality. That will probably disturb it in a way that I can't imagine at first. This is something we can easily avoid. And many other things, setting up the right, you know, the right setting and, and, and so on. These are tips that you can easily find, but check for them. Because sleep, good sleep is important. And also keeping an active life as a univocal, uh, uh, as a bidirectional correlation with quality of life keeping an active life is a sort of resilience. And just, just be aware, when I talk about active life, I'm not always talking about, you know, exercising. I'm not, all, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about sort of a mental active life. I can even be active with limited movement, but keeping an open and curious perspective and try to be creative and try to be open to new experiences. That, that also describes an active life. Of course, if we can, and that may be something to discuss with a physician, but if we can also insert some physical activity, that can also boost our mental health. But still, the openness is very important. Yeah, go ahead, thank you. And I'm, I've lost track of, of the time, so just let me know when it's almost done and I'll skip to the, to the end. Yeah, it, it's very, very interesting, Francesco. Um, we have very little time left, so if you... All right, can... all right, well, it's okay, it's okay. So this is a... Because uh, the message I want to arrive is right after this one, but this is a very important one, social support. 
sharing, ex sharing one's experience is very important. It's already a form of copying and talking about one's feeling and also listening to someone else is so important. So I wanna share one of the experiences we are having with the Italian Association of Bronchiectasis. And we have an online, an online support group, basically uh, about 20-ish people with bronchiectasis. Once a month, we meet together online and we share our, our own experience and we talk. And they found it so helpful because that's you know a protecting and secure environment in which one can just share one's opinion, experience, feeling, and so on, and feel accepted and also helpful because when I share my experience, somebody can take a part of it, take a part of that, and perhaps build on it. So this is something worth exploring everywhere, with of course different strategies and different methods. We can go to the next one, please. More in general, if you feel you have troubles, you know, on, on the psychological side, you feel very down, you feel very anxious, and the very can vary. So if you feel in need for a support, well, don't be shy. Right now, we have so many treatments, so many opportunities. We're no more in Freud's world. I mean, we have treatments that can can really boost our quality of life in few sessions, if that's the case. So psychotherapy and counseling can be extremely efficacious in improvement, in improving quality of life. And sometimes there's this st stigma that if I go to a psychologist, then I'm crazy. You know, these things are from the 800s. So, I mean, there's no need to keep them out. Uh, we can go to the final one, to the, to the next one, and that's pretty much it. Now, there are many options, many, many possibilities that we can have to support, to further support uh, our psychological well being. The gold standard for treating anxiety and depression, for example, is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. But then we can also go through some motivational interviewing, especially if I'm having troubles with adherence toward my, uh, my treatment, for example, I'm not totally persuaded. And I think there's some, some psychological setbacks or resistance on that side. I can, I can challenge that. I can go under family therapy, for example, when I feel that I want to involve my whole family in this treatment in, because I want them to hear what I want to hear, what I want to say. And I want to also hear on their side, relaxation, or biofeedback and, and meditation, it could be extremely helpful, both on the psychological and on the physical side. More in general, counseling, psychological support, every form of consultation in which I can share my feeling and get the knowledge for that. And mindfulness-based interventions, they're very, very effective and very powerful in the improvement of quality of life and the reduction of anxiety management of depressive features and so on. I think we're running out of time. Just get, I mean, I don't have any clock here, but just yeah, as a guide. We, we are already <laughs> over time. So I don't know okay, if there is sorry. any concluding remarks you would like to make, please. No, that, that's pretty much it. Your mental health matters. Just keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think, think from, from what, what I saw in the... In the in the, in the chat, chat there, there were lots, lots of patients, patients who could relate with what you presented, you presented to us. So that was very uh, interesting and eye-opening eye -opening for a lot, lot of people, people who haven't been uh, speaking, speaking with, with patients, patients uh, about, about these uh, consequences, consequences of the disease. Of the disease. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, now, we are going to quickly go to the, uh, questions, questions and answers. And answers uh, uh, Part, part of the, of the session. session and if and i can, can ask, ask everyone to be brief please in their replies, replies and, and probably have one, one question, question for one all all, all, all of, of the speakers, the speakers that, that would be great yeah. and i just answer one of the many questions that came up it's a question that came up really a lot some patients uh, mention in their personal story that stopping milk dairy products really helped them and 
absolutely it's possible but that's on an individual basis I just wanted to show that milk does not directly produce mucus but if you feel that there is a link between them check for milk allergies or lactose intolerance be because uh, the study that I showed with asthmatics all these patients were excluded from having allergies for milk so getting allergy for milk or being lactose intolerant can change your gut can cause inflammation and that inflammation can then affect also the lungs and therefore for some patients there is a link between both and that uh, just just wanted to point that out thank, thank you very, very much, much for, for clarifying, clarifying uh, peter, peter. Um, um so, so since, since we are, we are uh, in your uh, uh, S S dog, dog. Uh, can, uh, can I, I ask, ask one of the questions, questions that I saw on chat uh, for, for you and uh, Len? Um, uh, with, regards with regards to, to vegan, vegan, people, people who are vegetarian, vegetarian or vegan, vegan, do you have, have any, any special, special advice, advice for them? For them? Oh yeah, yeah. We, so the vegetarians and the vegans, um, w they need to make sure that they're uh, absolutely um, still having enough of the, the necessary nutrients. So obviously for vegan and, and vegetarians, they're going to avoid certain products that are important for bronchiectasis patients, for building muscle, for maintaining muscle and for maintaining good health. So that's the reason why especially these patients need to check for uh, per personal uh, health personal advice from the dietitian to help them choose and pick the right uh, meals uh, to, to, ma to make sure that they maintain weight, muscle and health. But it's certainly possible for vegan and vegetarian, so it's possible, but you need some professional advice. Yes, yes. Great, great to know. To know. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much for your answer. answer. Um, um, I also I thought to answer, to answer one, one of the of questions, questions about, about my talk, talk which, which was uh, that, that one of the patients uh, who is doing uh, postural drainers, they cannot do it uh, when they are outside home, and what can they do? And this comes back to uh, actually having more than one airway clearance techniques that you can use. So, so I guess, I guess this, this patient, patient could have, have one technique, technique that they can, they can use when they're outside and it could be the active cycle of breathing techniques, for example, where they can be independent, they can still do it, for example, if they go to a, a room by themselves uh, for a few minutes and they don't need to have a bed or chair or any special equipment for that. So, so I, think I think it's important, important for people, people to know, know that there's, there's lots of options that they can fit their uh, their needs and this is something that they can consider that they don't need to stick to one thing uh, that they do when they are well or when they're unwell they they can have different techniques they use in, in specific circumstances and this can be discussed with their respiratory physiotherapist but they need to um, express their needs clearly and, and uh, describe what are the barriers for them to perform airway clearance when they are in different situations. So I think that would be very useful for people. And Barbara, would you like to ask uh, the question to Francesco? I have something in mind, but if you do have a question for him, happy for you to, uh, to ask it. Barbara, you're muted. Um, do you think anti-anxiety anti medication interferes with breathing? As I've been told, it could slow the breathing down. I think this is an excellent question. And honestly, I don't have an answer because, uh, well, I'm, I do not prescribe, because I'm not a psychiatrist, I do not prescribe uh, anti-anxiety drugs but uh, so if, i think we, we need we need to ask that question to somebody with that, that expertise but more in general there's a thing because I, I read the question and, and and i thought we also need to just make mindful the physicians that if the patient comes to them and say well i'm experiencing anxiety just say okay just take this Xanax and and you're good may not be the best answer it may because in, uh, of course anti-anxiety could be a very valuable uh resource but you know we tend to read the the, the question that the patient would, would ask and if i'm asking for 
attention for just, just um, I'm experiencing anxiety, what can I do? Perhaps there are also other opportunities, other things that can come from a physician. Like maybe you can, you know, talk to this person and I can give you the, the reference or there is this group that can help. That could also be a resource. So not saying not providing drugs, of course, uh, but consider that, that possibility too. And are there other mental health support groups in, in other countries for bronchiectasis patients or is yours alone? I, I don't know of one in, in the UK, for instance. So um, uh, it was very interesting in the chat because many people uh, wrote about some Facebook group support groups. I think that's a, that's a very good start. Um, so just reading other people's experiences, sharing ones and getting feedback about that. Uh, it's already very uh, important and it's a way of building a community. I may suggest, I, I don't know how well developed all around Europe uh, these groups could be, but I may suggest the organizers of each of these groups to set up some live well, online live meetings uh, in which having the chances uh, to organize that. And if they can have a mental health professionals, mental health professional there just just to facilitate the discussion, that will work probably smoother than without. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to comment on the question about uh, slowing down uh, breathing with specific medications. Yes, it, it can happen. So it's always important to, when, you, when you're prescribed a medication, to be aware of the side effects that can, this can have and the physician to know all the conditions you, you have. So bronchiectasis would be something to flag up for this type of medication. And, they, and then the physician can identify something which hasn't got a strong relation to slowing down the breathing. So the last question for, from me would be to Barbara. And I would like to ask you, Barbara, um, what do you think we can do for people for, with bronchiectasis as a society? So we've discussed a lot about um, what we can do as healthcare professionals, what can patients do to manage their condition, but what do you think we need as a society for people with bronchiectasis to, to provide support and, and to make sure they are um, uh, well looked after? I think we should just talk about it more to our friends, to our relatives, to our social circles, so that people are more aware of it. Generally, people have never heard of it outside of the medical profession and fellow sufferers. So if people were more aware of it, like they are of asthma, um, I think it would uh, lead to better understanding of, of, of the difficulties that we might um, be dealing with. Um, and just to accommodate us better. Um, people see people with asthma because they, they have to use puffers and that's very evident, so they know what's wrong with them. Um, but people have never heard of bronchiectasis and they don't know the symptoms. Uh, and so they, they just don't know what to expect. Um, when when we go out for dinner with them or when we go out socially with them so it would be nice if, if people understood better and the only way that they're going to understand is for us to talk about to talk about it um to say that we've got bronchiectasis and, and this is this is what it means for us <sighs> Thank you very much. I think that's the best message to take away from this session, that we need to talk more about it and we need to make others aware of what it means for the patients. And we need to raise awareness for bronchiectasis uh, through our own networks and in the society in general. So thank you to all the speakers.